All right, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone um, to this lightning bolt on the second day of SOCAP. Um, my name is Chintan Panchal. I am the founder of uh, a international boutique law firm called RPCK. Um, RPCK is focused on helping multiple bottom line investors, entrepreneurs, organizations, um, execute, conceptualize, um, and structure a variety of corporate and financing transactions around the world. Um, we have uh, had the opportunity to work with a broad range of folks that come from different philosophical perspectives, um, some of which you'll you'll hear uh, in today's uh, presentations. Start, you know, kind of on the one hand, uh, kind of an impact first, um, kind of sol solving problems perspective, and on the other hand, a kind of financial first. Uh, making returns perspective and all sorts of things in, in between. Um, I am very excited about today's conversation. We have Yasmin Saltuk Lamy from the CDC, which is uh, the CDC Group, which is the United Kingdom's DFI, the Development Finance Institution. Um, and Yasmin is the Deputy Chief Investment Officer. Um, we're also joined by Greg Nietzschean, um, who is with the Kenny Arth Group, which is a family office. Um, focused on uh, in impact investing and uh, a wide variety, and both have a, a depth of experience and wide variety of um, transaction and uh, and and, and kind of field building experience. Um, so, in today's presentation, um, we are going to you know have a couple of TED Talk style uh, presentations, followed by a moderated discussion, um, which I think is going to be a lively one. Um, we're going kick off with Yasmin's uh, presentation, which is going to be a bit of a look back in terms of what we've experienced and what we've, you know, what we've been through in respect of the pandemic and, and kind of many of the factors leading up to what we've been doing and what some of the leading impact investors in the space have been working on. After Yasmin, we're going to hear from Greg in terms of his perspective on what we as an impact investing community should be looking towards and 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 thinking about as we move forward into the into the future of our space. So without further ado, uh, I will hand it over to Yasmin. Thank you, Chintan. Hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today. So in thinking about the title of my my talk, my TED talk, I I was reflecting a lot about what my personal and professional journey was over the months proceeding really in the in the context of crisis response and I landed on the title crisis response when boring can be beautiful and so that's what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes I thought I would start with a little personal context and share with you all my favorite toy this is a backhoe loader I loved it as a child because this arm looked to me like a little dinosaur arm that could dig into the dirt and build things and this speaks very much to the way I approach my work even to this day. I'm a builder and everything I've done in my career has been working within institutions. Some would call that an entrepreneurial uh, approach, working within institutions to think about building a new practice or, or pushing their capital to work harder for impact. So I started out at JP Morgan, uh, moved over to Omidyar Network and now at CDC working from a mainstream financial institution to a specialized impact investor, and now a, the UK's development finance institution. At CDC, the portfolio that I manage is called the Catalyst Strategies. When I first joined CDC, it was called the Higher Risk Portfolio. And when I came on board two years ago, I said, that has to be the first thing that changes around here. Um, I felt very strongly that you don't go into the market saying, I'm looking for higher risk. You go into the market saying, I'm looking for this kind of impact. And so we rebranded it to the Catalyst Strategies, the idea being it's all about shaping nascent markets. And the, the kind of simple analogy I give people to describe how Catalyst works relative to our main, main portfolio of work, the growth portfolio, is the growth portfolio is very much investing for impact. CDC has been doing this for over 70 years. And every investment we make through the growth portfolio or the catalyst portfolio has a development impact thesis that is either aligned to inclusion or sustainability or productivity. There are targets and benchmarks and an ex post measurement exercise conducted to ensure impact all along that journey for every investment we make. 
So how is Catalyst different? So the way I describe it is this. If this is, if, if we're talking in the context of the growth portfolio, one of our deal team leads might go into the market and find this pen. They find this pen, they say, this looks like a nice pen. I like the color. They check it right. They say, great, looks like a good pen. They take it to investment committee. They ask the investment committee, do you think we could buy this pen? Investment committee checks that it writes and confirms, yes, you can buy the pen. They put it in the pocket. They might find this pen and they sniff around and they source a cap and they put that together and then they say, great, this is a good pen. I see, can we buy the pen? Yes, okay, good, put it in the pocket. In Catalyst, we start with the cap. It doesn't write, <laughs> but we have a vision that we can construct this and we can bring it to the investment committee and put it in our pocket. And so there is this inherent kind of builder's mentality to the way that we work with catalytic capital at CDC. In terms of our COVID response, that was challenged in a really, I think a really positive way. And this is the story I wanted to share today. So some, just to give you an example of some of the other things in the Catalyst portfolio today, we created a company from scratch called MedAccess, for example. This was uh, established in 2017. MedAccess is a company dedicated to changing the landscape of the pharmaceutical manufacturing marketplace to create a market for low cost affordable products. We also have two strategies dedicated to energy access across the utility value chain from utility scale to households working on clean energy access across Africa and Asia. When it came to COVID response, it was not the time to build something brand new, but we found the right way to apply the capability that we have with our catalyst strategies. And that's the story I'll talk through right now. But first, before we dive into what happened with our catalytic capital, let me tell you a little bit about what happened across CDC when COVID struck. So we are, we are a firm dedicated for impact. It's inherent in every person who works at CDC. And I think, you know, we were all thrown into personal circumstances that were extremely challenging. And first and foremost, we were all, you know, supporting each other and our portfolio companies to make sure everyone was safe and sound as much as possible. Right after that was, we have an existing portfolio. We have supported these companies to deliver impact, including a lot of job creation ambition. And that suddenly was in serious risk. And so there was a significant effort around how do we preserve that impact and preserve the value that we've created through these companies over time. So, you know, strictly into top gear straight away, we need to preserve value and impact in the portfolio. The next thing that started to happen was, I describe it as this popcorn effect of ideas, really interesting opportunistic ideas that were not just rescue funding, but hey, there's a company in our portfolio that creates ventilators in India. There will be demand for ventilators, so we should be supporting this company to grow. Or there's another company in our portfolio, M Pharma in Africa, which is a uh, digital pharmaceutical platform they could actually distribute COVID vaccines, they could distribute PPE, they could distribute much needed products at the time, um, and they had the, the capacity to scale up. So there is this you know, very um, immediate need to preserve and rescue and, and um, stabilize companies in our portfolio, but there's this additional need to strengthen COVID response through companies that had an opportunity to actually scale up. Another company in our portfolio is Big Basket, an online grocery in India that saw a staggering demand increase. So we organized our COVID response across the preserve pillar, the strengthen pillar, and then there was a third pillar called rebuild, which was always about thinking about our, our pipeline long-term. We were never going to step back from the market. We always wanted to step up at a time of need and rebuild signals to you know, for us, it was an important signal to our partners that we are here for you in the long term. So within that, we designed two pillars of our strength and response. One was really focused around systemic liquidity. So, you know, expecting capital to seize up and especially pull back from emerging markets, we said we need to be putting new capital at risk into the market. But that's quite a frightening idea when you have no idea what's happening in the world, right? So 
how do you do that in a way that's prudent? And this is where I came to, huh, you know, my whole career I have focused on innovation, the new, the interesting. And here is this very tried and tested tool called trade finance that CDC had been using in other places. Um, simple working capital facilities in partnership with large banks. And we just recognize the value of this as a tool at a time of crisis. So first of all, it lines up with the demand from the customers. You're not asking them to value equity. Trying to put equity into a business at a time of crisis is not the easiest thing to do. And you're not leveraging up the company with term debt. You're just meeting working capital needs for especially a short time um, capital constraint situation. It's a prudent instrument for the risk taker. So for CDC, you're taking very short term risk um, in smaller pieces across a very diversified portfolio. And finally, for us, we were working with existing partners. We already had relationships with partner banks. And so it was just a matter of scaling up and in some cases putting preferential terms in place to say, if you direct capital to these COVID sectors, we can offer you this preferential term. Or if you can direct capital to these priority countries, we can offer you some preferential terms. And with these structures in place, we were able to approve over $500 million of commitments in months where the uncertainty in the markets would have limited you know, much investment at all. So it really taught me <laughs> that you know innovation is wonderful and tried and tested can be very powerful. Boring can be beautiful when you need to move fast, when you don't have a lot of information to work off of. Having said that, I think we're also you know, working to build markets with a view towards the future. And so I thought I would also use this small window to talk briefly about one of the new practices we're trying to incorporate into our investment, which is trend spotting, future proofing the portfolio, working with a practice that is thinking about um, how the world could change in the next years, decade, to think about what we should be preparing today. A year ago, one of my colleagues in our strategy team had published, well, I think published internally, but she had put out content around the risk of pandemics and superbugs. And many of us read that material. Right, but if we had stopped and thought a little bit more carefully about well, what would what, what would change in our practice if this came to came to fruition, uh, maybe we would have been that one step ahead in our COVID response. I'll stop there. I'm excited to hear what Greg has to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, excellent. And now, uh, Greg, tell us a little bit about how. You know what what your perspective is on how we should be thinking about you know looking towards the future um you know of kind of investing in and solving kind of big problems sure Th thanks Jintan. um hey everybody good morning um my name is greg nietzsche i'm the director of kenny arth the family office of diane eisenberg um i was thinking about yasmin's analogy of uh, the backhoe i guess if um if CDC is the sort of institutional builder with the, the backhoe, we might be the wrecking ball at Kenny Arth. So um, I don't have my uh, one of my son's little wrecking ball as my prop, but uh, but I think um, some of my remarks might might get into that. So it is time for us to admit that much of the impact investing sector is built on a lie, and if not a lie, certainly a half truth. It's time for us to admit that the idea that we can do well by doing good, that we can generate impact while not sacrificing financial returns, or perhaps even more farcically, that we can generate better than average returns, this idea, this myth has tarnished our sector. If you take one thing away from this talk and one thing only, it is this. If you genuinely want to have an impact on society's most intractable problems, widening economic inequality, racial injustice, and catastrophic impact of climate change on vulnerable communities, you need to be prepared to make financial sacrifices. Now, don't get me wrong. The idea of investing more responsibly, of pursuing the well-intentioned double bottom line, it's a good thing. The fact that 
mainstream investors are now paying closer attention to ESG factors that influence the long-term health of their public equity portfolio or are focusing on diversity on corporate boards or seeking minority-led fund managers. All of that is positive change. Clean tech, ed tech, biotech, vegan fast food, organic raspberries, tasty, kind of, and sure, generally positive but none of it makes a meaningful difference in improving the lives of people living in poverty. How do we know this? We tried it. When we started Kenny Earth eight years ago, and by we, I mean Diane with me supporting her, we gave it a shot. Diane had a guiding North Star that she wanted our capital to practically and demonstrably have an impact on people living in poverty, but we were open-minded, even to those preaching that we could have it all. We built a portfolio with a wide range of impact investing modalities from more conventional public equity and private equity commitments to higher risk PRI making and everything in between. And we watched and waited. The conventional impact investing portion of our portfolio, which incidentally included every gold-plated name in the sector from generation to bridges to bain double impact it did fine financially in fact it did better than fine but there was no way that we could look ourselves in the mirror and claim that these investments were doing the most we could to get capital into vulnerable communities similarly our pri making was as impactful as it could be delivering pilot loans to early stage enterprises in developing economies, but it came with significant risks of capital impairment. And we knew that we wanted to build a strategy that could recycle the majority of our money over time. In the end, we found that our most successful investments fell between the ends of this continuum. We found funds and enterprises that had lower risk profiles, but that required lower costs of capital. We saw that we could be impact first in what we did, but we could still make modest returns to continue our strategy in perpetuity. Not only could we make modest returns, but we have demonstrated that we can be catalytic. We are able to incent others into transactions, leveraging our investment. We're able to deliver capital at a cost that allows fund managers and enterprises to stay focused on the most underserved communities without feeling pressure to drift up market. In some, we can't do well and do good, but we can do okay and do much good. And so this is what we do. We have a team of 12 and we execute 25 to 30 transactions every year. We commit between 30 and $40 million annually. That money goes to funds like Global Partnerships, a nonprofit impact investment firm out of Seattle that invests in specialized microfinance institutions and small enterprises globally. They have $3 million junior investment from Kenny Arth alongside a million dollars from the Kellogg Foundation and a million dollars from global partnerships, partnerships themselves, unlocked $50 million in senior lending capital from the DFC, all of it priced at 2%. Capital at that rate means global partnerships can remain hyper-focused on the hardest to serve communities. Similarly, we built a $30 million loan portfolio in the U.S. CDFI market, serving persistent poverty regions, allocating capital to CDFIs like OISTA, serving native communities, FAHI, serving Appalachia, and Rock USA that supports residents in manufactured home communities to cooperatize and take ownership of their parks. Now, we didn't do any of this from a sense of moral superiority, that less returns are better, we did this because this is the right answer to delivering impact capital to the communities we want to serve. It would have been great and would have allowed us to invest even more if double bottom line investing really worked in these places, but it doesn't. Delivering below market capital was the only way that we could have deep, meaningful impact. All that said, I'm not here to take to task those pursuing responsible investment. I don't think it's helpful to label them as impact investors, but these are semantic distinctions. If you're an institutional investor with fiduciary constraints, an individual with liquidity needs for you or your kids, by all means, carry on. More, invest, more responsible investment practices are good. 
they are necessary, but not sufficient to move the needle, particularly around issues of social and financial inequality. There are some people I am here to take to task though. <laughs> the investors who stand on conference stages using hyperbolic language about challenging systems, but who do very little at their institu institutions to turn that talk into action. Conveners that ask us to think revolutionary thoughts, but demand absolutely nothing from us other than ticket purchases and sponsorship dollars, so-called thought leaders and movement makers that wildly inflate their knowledge and experience and act as gatekeepers only to stoke their own egos. This is all very simple. Impact investors are not brain surgeons or rocket scientists. We do not cure cancer or COVID. We do not educate children or deliver food to the hungry. We are not heroes. We move money and that money has a price. When that price has to be the risk adjusted market rate that commercial investors would expect, then you do not go to the places where markets have failed. Sure, you might tiptoe on the edges funding, say, mixed use housing projects in gentrifying neighborhoods in the United States or solar home systems for peri-urban consumers in Africa, but your money will be too expensive to effectively serve more deeply vulnerable populations. So what is it that I'm asking you to do? I I'm just asking you to be honest with your intentions and to pursue strategies that genuinely support those intentions. We invest a lot by family office standards, but it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what is needed. Sadly, we find few fellow travelers on this journey. The lone bright spots in the past few years have been partnerships with international development institutions like CDC, who, while certainly bureaucratic, have opened their deep pockets to deliver large scale, low cost capital to challenging places. We've also been really heartened to see select foundations moving faster than ever in response to the COVID crisis. For example, together with the Packard Foundation, the Schmidt Foundation, and the Olamina Fund, we were able to pool an $11 million facility providing 0% capital that allowed CDFI partners to make urgent PPP loans to small businesses. We need others to join us in this catalytic impact first movement, and we're willing to help get in touch. We're happy to share everything and anything we're doing. I just want to conclude by saying that there is only one reason that I get to sit here and spout off like this. And it is not because I myself am a courageous truth teller fighting for marginalized communities. It is because I have the blessing of working for a courageous truth teller fighting for marginalized communities. If this industry handed out keynote slots for actual action taken and dollars deployed, Diane Eisenberg, Kenny Arth's founder, would be on stage at every conference. She is not. Because this industry is not a meritocracy. It is no better than every other industry, where status accrues to the friendliest networkers, the most connected, those willing to pay for recognition, if you really want this industry to make a difference in the long run, we need to be better and bolder. We need to be honest where we are having an impact on people's lived experiences and where we aren't. We need to put impact first in impact investing. Only then do we deserve to think we are doing anything different than anyone else. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you both. Thank you both. Lots of really interesting and provocative ideas uh, and, and topics there. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw out a couple of, uh, a couple of questions to you guys, and then we're going to open up to the broader conversation. But I think we just heard two very powerful calls to action, right? One is that Boring can be beautiful. Look at what's there. Look at what has been done before. Don't try to be the most innovative, creative kid on the block, uh, kind of, you know, and, and, and bringing the most uh, sophisticated, complex, you know, solutions to these old problems um, or new problems. 
and be better and bolder, right? Uh, kind of re-examine who we are, what we're doing and why we're doing it, and then be honest with ourselves and with, with our community with, with respect to how we go about doing that. I applaud, I applaud you both in, in, in bringing both of these kind of ideas and, and calls to action to us as a broader community. Um, so just to kind of kick off, a question uh, for you, Yasmin. So you, you mentioned, you know, the, the ability to kind of repurpose, you know, and use, utilize kind of, you know, uh, kind of trade finance, for example, right, to kind of and apply it to a, to a novel situation, novel solution. I, I love that idea. I think that there are many, many great examples of repurposing tools that have been used in, in other kind of impact agnostic kind of areas of the, of the sector and, and applying them to kind of these new challenges. What do, you, what do you say about the fact that the fact that these challenges persist speaks to their kind of multi-layered, multi-dimensional and intractable kind of nature, right? That someone who might, you know, come to you and say, well, listen, the, we've been doing these things all along and they haven't worked. That's why the world looks like the way it looks today. And why, why, how can we assume that a simple kind of approach is going to get us or using what we've kind of used in the past is going to get us to a different outcome in the future that we we all seek to achieve? What do you say to that kind of perspective? Mm. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Chintan. I'm not saying everything will be fixed by simple things, but I think we can be enamored and seduced by pursuing the new. And I think impact investors by their nature have to be people who are champions of something new because it is a new way of thinking about financial capital allocation. I mean, let's, let's think about the, it's not just impact investors, but let's think about some of the changes that we've seen this year, for example, Social movements have been happening for decades, right? I mean, protests on the street are not a new thing. Um, even frustration about police brutality in the context of Black Black Lives Matter before it was called that, right, has, has been present for, for decades in the United States. But this year was the first time that there were capital allocation decisions made on the back of that movement. Um, so there's a lot of power in in heading in a new direction and applying a new mindset to things. I don't want to discount that. I just mean when you're facing forward, you can sometimes forget to look behind you and we need to actually kind of face sideways maybe, <laughs> make sure that we have everything in, in our periphery. Mm -hmm. um, a fisheye lens, maybe the, the good analogy here. Yeah. And I think in terms of, I mean, you're also calling on this question about change and what happens when, when it's not arriving. And someone in a, in a webinar a couple of weeks ago asked me about, you know, are we at the tipping point of impact investing? And I said, I don't really believe in tipping points anymore. I used to think that change and progress happened in, in one direction that you always got better. Society always got better. Oh. And I think the last couple of years have shown me that's not true. <laughs> um, and I'm speaking mostly about the political context, but I think, you know, multipolar bifurcations of society, whether it was about politics or now about COVID, even people, you know, coming into conflict with each other, just about how they practice public health um, protections or not, the arguments that are coming. I mean, these kinds of, um, these kinds of trends that we're seeing in our society have, have shown me that progress doesn't always move forward. And so instead of a tipping point, I think about it a little bit like waves crashing on the shore. So you have, you know, the, cra the wave comes over and makes the big splash up top, but actually yep. underneath the surface, some people are pulling back. Yep. And the question is, is the overall tide coming in or is the overall tide going out? Great. Yeah. Great. I mean, yeah. I, I, I might, I might play on that analogy because, um, I think some days we, we we feel like we're just you know man in a life raft and just, just sort of um, paddle, paddling around looking for looking for folks to save. I I guess um, 
you know, we we often do get this question about how do we think about the future and how do we, you know, reimagine the future, re, re, restructure the future. And, um, you know, I, I often say it's way above our pay grade to, to sort of figure out how to explain how to fix it, that, that we're just we're just lending money to, to people who otherwise wouldn't have access to it. And while I agree with all these critiques that, you know, the world is horribly unfair and that access to opportunities unequal, the economy is entirely stacked. Uh, you know, we see ourselves in some ways as the emergency room doctors of the situation. <laughs> and um, a lot of what we're trying to do um, with some of these simple things that that Yasmin is um, has has talked so well about is is trying to really stop the bleeding of these sort of societal collisions and and injustices and um, you know I think a lot of what we do is trying to sort of stabilize the situation so that we can make incremental improvements over time and we do see those incremental improvements you know in our work with smallholder farmers we're seeing increases in income year over year in in our work in the US CDFI market we see you know pre pre crisis of course we we see we see change slowly but um but but it but it happens so i i think that um you know i think there is a lot of beauty in sort of incrementalism and persistence um and recognizing that these things don't change um, in a matter of months or years or sometimes even decades, but um, but that doesn't make the work any any less important. Mm. Excellent, thank you, um, Greg. I want to I want to both agree with the sentiment that you've you've uh, you've shared, but also push back a little bit. So, you know, I agree, right? We're not, you know, our impact investors are not the kind of uh, emergency room surgeons, um, kind of in the operating room, kind of saving, saving the world. But I, I think that, you know, you would also probably agree that capital is like oxygen, right? Capital is like gasoline that you pour into an engine, which can be an organization. It can be an enterprise. It can be, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it can, you know, it, it is the means of producing, right. It kind of, collecting human effort and producing widgets or energy or services or whatever, right? And that capital is incredibly necessary. And I agree with you that the capital has a price. So two questions for you. One is, is your perspective really more focused on folks who like yourself have the ability to invest at below market returns, right? And I think you recognize, right? So it's not bad to, you know, invest alongside, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the big, the big private equity funds, et cetera. But is the, is the critique more, more uh, appropriately focused on folks who actually have the liberty to seek below market returns, number one? And then number two, what, what do you say to the argument that concessionary capital, below market applications of capital in developing and nascent markets often has the effect of distorting those markets, right? It has the effect of subsidizing, you know, the, the least efficient or less efficient um, participants in the market and preventing, you know, healthy competition or, or stifling innovation, right? Some of these arguments that you hear out there, I, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective and your response to to those perspectives. Uh, great questions. How much time do I get? Um, <laughs> so um, let, let me um, I'll tackle them both. I guess um, I'll give the short answers to both. I guess the first the first one, who is this critique targeted at? Um, it, it, it very much is ta targeted towards those who have the flexibility and the mission to do this work to impact marginalized communities. Th this is not a message. I I'm not sitting here trying to convince pension fund managers and sovereign wealth managers and you know people who are in retail investors who are using this money to pay their mortgage or their kids' college bills. That that is not that that's not our that's not our world at all. And and like I said in the talk, I think that the fact that that part of the 
impact investing universe is moving in a more responsible direction, I think that's great. You know, I can be flipping about it um, mostly just for provocation's sake, but I, I think it's good and I think um, all of it should be applauded and there's absolutely nothing. I have no critique of it. it it's good, do more of it, right? <laughs> so my, you know, our, our critique at Kenny Art is, is much more about those who do have the flexibility and the mandate to do this. That's mm -hmm. family offices with more capital than they ever will need. That is foundations that have been set up specifically to address issues of poverty, development institutions that have development in the title of their institution. You know, these are the kinds of people that we want to try to motivate um, to do more and um, and try to, uh, to try to illuminate why they should be pushing their capital um, their capital further. So I guess short answer is yes. This is a this is a very targeted message to those who who can do that. The mm -hmm. second question was about um, does below market capital distort um, distort market? So I guess I have two responses. One is. Um, where the places we are, whether we're in developing economies or developed economies, if you talk about persistent poverty regions in the US, there's not a competition for capital. So, you know, we're not coming in and replacing what otherwise would be a market rate solution um, to a particular challenge in a particular place. So, you know, the fact that we're providing low cost capital to lend to small farmers in sub-Saharan Africa and certain communities, we're not distorting that there is a market rate lender coming into that place. We're, we're, we're there because financial, institu financial institutions are not serving that area. Um, and so I don't think there's, there's a competition for that capital. And that's true whether that's in you know, East Africa or Itabina, Mississippi. Um, I, I, think that thesis, I think that thesis holds. And then I'd say the last thing is, in many ways, um, particularly in in developing economies, I would say that the the capital that it's distorting is Western venture capital that is you know expecting incredibly fast growth trajectories um, out of um, out of uh, sort of marginalized communities and is really pushing a lot of businesses to grow in ways that can be. Um, incredibly irresponsible. If you looked at what happened in sort of the financial inclusion fintech space in um, in sub-Saharan Africa, now you have a, a, you have a lot of room for um, for um, uh, for real sort of customer um, customer harm. And um, so I, I think there's there's a lot uh, to think about in terms of whether that market rate capital can be can be distortive and hurtful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That that's that's great. I think what we're what we're talking about here is that this is a big and multifaceted challenge, right? And there are kind of the right applications for the right type of capital, and you know there there is a good there is a good reason for uh, kind of concessionary capital in the right instance and where where it can be applied, especially when tied to the right kind of motives behind it, right? And, and I and I, I appreciate your kind of call to action. Um, I'm going to try to string together a few of the comments that we're getting uh, from our from our audience now. So, one of one of the things, uh, Greg uh, and Yasmin, uh, that you guys both kind of touched upon briefly were opportunities where you your institutions have had a chance to work together. And what I really want to kind of drive you know kind of dive deeper into is this idea of being catalytic. Right, so the instances in which capital that has different expectations behind it, right? So return-seeking capital, impact-seeking capital, some blend of the two where they can start to work together. And so I think you know we can recognize that both of your institutions have very similar kind of impact-driven perspectives. So I don't want to limit you know your examples to just that instance in which you you alluded to that you guys had an opportunity to work together. But I'd love for you guys to share some instances in which you've seen some success stories, where you've seen some opportunities where maybe Kenny Arth or kind of the CVC group was able to come in with kind of concessionary capital, providing very patient, low cost capital and incubating an opportunity or 
you know, kind of directing capital to people who really needed it to help them just come up to a level of being able to be kind of competitive and self-sustaining, et cetera. Um, and, you know, and, and that you can point to as a good success story where, where maybe later on in time, more market, you know, return seeking investors were able to come in and partner with capital at a later stage or at a time when it was more appropriate. You know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to hear, I think the audience would love to hear, um, you know, uh, some some examples uh, of, of what you guys think are, are, are good and successful applications of some of the things that we're talking about. Great question. I love talking about the examples because that's really what we're here for. So, I mean, there are several elements to your question, and I would like to use this opportunity to cover off different pieces that tell the story together. So one element is you use the phrase concessionary capital. And we like the phrase catalytic capital. Um, they're slightly different in my view because concessionary makes, it's a bit like when I said we called it the higher risk portfolio at first and yep. then realized that we have to reposition it towards what are we trying to achieve. So we're not trying to achieve concessions. We can use concessions. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that's been really powerful for CDC's practice has been to orient the order of the questions that we ask in the right order. So start with what impact are you trying to have? Second question, what risk does that mean you need to take? And third question, what does that then imply about the returns you should expect? And what that means for us is that we have a range of risk and return profiles within the portfolio. So some of the you know expected returns for an investment we have a venture capital strategy, for example. So M Pharma, like I described, that's a co-investment that we've made with a fund manager. Um, that company, I would say, has an average expected return in line with our growth portfolio. It is a venture stage company. It could scale quite quite quickly. It doesn't need a lot of cap, you know, capex investment to get there. Um, but the uncertainty around that might be wider than maybe some of the direct equity investments that we make in our growth portfolio. So it's less about starting with are we taking a discount on the price and more about are we taking more risk or a different kind of risk than we might normally in our portfolio yep. having said that there are times that we do use elements of subsidy or we make concessions in the terms and i describe the preferential terms in our trade finance covid response in investments and in that case one of the tools that we use is kind of a hierarchy of preference so i I would put pricing concession at the bottom of the list. Like if you need to keep it in your back pocket, if you really need to go there, you know, it's possible. But the first option I prefer are non-pricing concessions. Like, are you gonna offer a longer tenor? Are you gonna take a more subordinated position than you might otherwise? Maybe you'll think differently about the security package. Those are, those are pref preferred concessions to make for me because they have less of an immediate and kind of explicit uh, distortive pricing effect. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. And then I think in terms of examples, you you asked for example investments. I I can talk about, I mentioned MedAccess, I could talk about their first volume guarantee. So the way their model works is the idea is to take a high cost, low volume market and make it a low cost, high volume market. So if you're going to swap, make that swap, you need to offer volume in sales. And the reason why many manufacturers stay in the high margin space is they don't have any sight on the demand, right? And the volume of demand. So if you can offer that volume guarantee and say, I will underwrite X purchase at Y price, please manufacture the goods and then off you go into the market. So you kind of front run that uncertainty, put, put some certainty in place. Um, and MedAccess was working with a company called Hologic to shift the viral load testing machine for HIV, the, the manufacturing marketplace for that. And with an $18 million guarantee, they changed the way the machine works, the, the cost of the machine, but also the procurement mechanism around governments purchasing that machine for aid programs so that it moved from a oh, you need to buy this machine for $100, but you also have to buy, you know, like um, the printer cartridge or the <laughs> all the different consumable elements were not priced into the procurement. 
And so their model was they changed the price of the product and they changed the procurement process, which is part of the market shaping thesis of net access. Um, so the catalytic element of our capital is that we created a company that didn't exist before. They are using a technology. The volume guarantee has been tried and tested by the Gates Foundation, but not with a fee. And mm. what we're testing is turning this into a revenue generating model. And it's crossing the domain of public health and private sector. So that's another element that often features in our catalytic capital work is that you kind of have a public good element or a first mover disadvantage, which means you're taking some more costs than you would in a purely commercial investment. Yep, great, thank you, thank you. Greg, would you like to add any perspective? Sure, yeah, I, I think that was actually a great um, a great overview of, of the different set of tools, which I, I, I couldn't agree with more that, um, as you approach each of these situations, considering each of those um, levers is is really important. Um, I, I think too often we're we're asked to, to sort of do all of them together: low pricing, subordinate, um, you know, first fund, first time fund manager. Um, but um, but I think just just to cite a few examples, because I I think what's interesting um, about some examples is that. Um, you know, oftentimes we are asked to take different positions in those blended capital stacks, um, depending on what that partner might need. So in in the talk, I, I cited um, Global Partnerships Impact First Development Fund, um, which is a, a facility we put together last year um, with the DFC, um, OPIC at the time, um, where $5 million in junior capital um, from us and, and and the Kellogg Foundation was able to um, be levered up to 10, 10, 10 times um, to bring in fifty million dollars of senior debt from from OPEC. Now that example is sort of like the impact leverage unicorn. Um, in some ways, I, I I hesitate to use it because well, you know, <laughs> we rarely see such good um, uh, such good leverage on our money, but. I think that that's what we're trying to replicate in other situations. There are other, you know, for example, another fund, um, Sun Funder, which um, is a, a large energy access fund, the situation's reversed. There are some development institutions that are at the bottom of that stack and have offered both first loss and some junior subordinate capital. And we're in there as a senior lender because the gap was to fill that senior um, lower cost 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 debt tranche. Um, and then the last place I'll, I'll give example of, of some of that blended leverage is in um, is in the US CDFI market where um, CDFIs are really in need of, of both equity and um, secondary capital in order to be able to raise either senior debt or in the case of deposit taking institutions to, to, to raise more deposits on top of, of, of that money. So a good example for us is Hope Credit Union um, which works in the Mississippi Delta um, and has been for, for decades serving um, really deeply underserved communities um, in, in that region. Um, their credit union was in need of secondary capital so that they could actually just raise more deposits. From a regulatory perspective, they need that underlying um, that underlying sort of equity-like position. And that was a place where we could go in and um, you know, write a three million dollar secondary loan, ten year loan at at a at a low interest rate that allowed them to to raise deposits on top of it. So, I, I think there's a lot of these blended finance transactions that we get into when we talk about catalytic capital. I, very few of them um, are actually crowding in market rate capital or commercial capital. Most of them are crowding in larger development capital or foundation capital. Right. And do you think that's a function of time or do you think that's a function of something kind of broader I, going on in space? I, right? I, I, I think it's a function of the of the sectors we serve. So, mm -hmm. you know, I guess earlier you asked sort of who my, my my critique, my point of view is also very specific to the fact that we work on poverty in marginalized communities, primarily rural communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I were speaking about if I were a pure climate investor worried about how to, you know, ha how to reduce car carbon. I might, I, yeah, I might be, I might be saying, boy, how do I move billions and trillions into big renewable energy funds? Mm -hmm. That's not my 
patch of the world. So, um, so I sort of leave that leave that to somebody else. So my my you know my my critique and my um, R and R experience is certainly specific to um, to to the issues we work on. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got about ten minutes left. Um, you got you guys can see the you guys can see the comments along the side. Were there any kind of points that you wanted to specifically speak to? Is there you know I think we've got some really interesting discussion going on in the in the um, comment bar in the chat bar where people are talking you know call, calling out kind of Darren Dodson's work at Illumin Capital. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, you know there's there's this comment you know, there's, there's a couple of points about kind of this idea of this valley of death right which talks about kind of the sequencing of capital and you know and Greg I think you gave a, a good example of you know, coming in with the capital when and where it's needed, right? This, the valley of death question is super interesting to me because I think that it's so prevalent, right? There's so many investors that, you know, are looking for kind of deals at the very, you know, early stage of the growth of an enterprise. There are lots of investors that are available, private equity, et cetera, at kind of, you know, close to exit. And you have this, you know, you have this situation where lots of enterprises, social enterprises, you know, um, just run out of capital. Um, I, I think the question in there is, you know, is there a role, is there a call to action for folks? Is there a way to, to get people to think about kind of entrepreneurship and, you know, the, 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 the kind of social good that these types of enterprises, you know, are doing in the world? And, you know, is it also something that is deserving? And how, how do we crack that nut? I mean, I think there's one aspect. Yeah. I think there's one aspect which is recognizing, um, you know, I think when, if I think back ten years, there was this again back to that progress moves in one direction. There was this thesis that you could be the catalytic investor and then you would pass the baton on, mm -hmm. and that might be true if you were the investor in fund one. Um, but you, I mean, it's just becoming clearer and clearer that you have to stay on the journey longer than you might have thought you needed to when when we started in this market. And whether that's with a fund manager or a company, um, I think there's extending that horizon uh, from the investor perspective is an important element. I think there's a second element, which is that there are, I mean, kind of Greg's description as well, you know, Kenny Arth and CDC might be active on this side of the spectrum, which is the higher risk Mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe impact first side of the spectrum. And then there's the other side of the spectrum where you can still use catalytic capital, but maybe the intention is not that you're stepping into high risk domain in what the investment is, is supporting, but rather you're bringing that commercial capital in on top of you. So you kind of have divergent of purpose, divergence of purpose, maybe we call it. Um, one is catalytic capital for the higher risk end of the spectrum and for pioneering new impact theses and the other is catalytic capital for mobilization and I think probably it's worth thinking about those as two separate things because they're taking different kinds of risk um, and I think on the value of death if you're if you're able to mobilize that capital like first there's just catalytic capital investors who are pioneering something new but they're not going to jump straight to the other end of the spectrum I guess that's what I'm saying you have to take steps along that journey and there are investors in the middle, but maybe there are too many barbells mm -hmm. or it's too barbell today and we need to kind of bring the full yeah. spectrum into place. Absolutely, absolutely. So so what, what I'm hearing is that, you know, there there's a strong need for kind of interconnection and connectivity, cooperation, collaboration, right? Not just in applying capital in, you know, in a blended finance kind of, you know, structure which we've discussed, but also in terms of, you know, and, and what we're talking about here is applying capital, but obviously it's broader than that. But, you know, kind of sequencing, bringing kind of different sources, you know, or return seeking expectations together. And I think that also speaks to a couple of the comments that we've had, you know, in, in the bar there, which is this kind of idea of inclusiveness, right? And so, you know, and, and Greg, I think you, you touched upon this, I think, in a really kind of, uh, kind of powerful way in, in your talk, right? When you, you 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 
effectively effectively take a lot of you know many parts of our community to task for you know being not that different from other capital markets out there right if you're you know a good networker and you are willing to pay for sponsorships and you're willing to you know etc then you have the spotlight shined on you and you can you know you have easier access to capital etc cetera, etc cetera, right what what do you guys think about this idea of and the need for being more inclusive being kind of not just being more inclusive, but seeking out and privileging different voices that need to be heard, especially from kind of the 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 side and and the communities that we're looking to work with, right? You know, in a lot of you know a lot of these conferences, I think SoCap is actually pretty good about this. But in a lot of these conferences, we hear the perspective of the impact investor, whether they're you know whatever the return seeking kind of you know, wherever they fall on the return seeking spectrum. One of the things that you know is often left out of the conversation, I think, some one of the kind of valid critiques is 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 the kind of the local perspective, right? Kind of the folks who would be the target of that investment, of that development, of that, et cetera, right? And you know, I, I just love to kind of hear your perspectives, just you know, personally, or kind of what you guys have seen, what you guys are doing in respect of inclusiveness with a broad definition, right? Not just kind of racial and gender and economic, you know, kind of uh, uh, inclusiveness, but but also from the perspective of, you know, the voices, you know, that are coming out of the places that we're looking to to do this work. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on, on this. I, I guess, um, you know, I, I guess the, the first, the first step in terms of inclusivity is just opening up that conversation and, and, and asking um, and, and talking to customers and, and talking to communities that, um, that, we're, that we're trying to serve. So if you're not having those conversations, you, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna go anywhere. I mean, one of the things we've done recently, which we're, we're proud of is um, made a lead investment in, um, in spinning off a, a business called um, 60 Decibels, which spun out of Acumen. Um, that uh, really sort of pioneered this lean data methodology of um, surveying customers um, to generate insights that can help social enterprises um, and other institutions uh, better better serve customers. Because I think at the end of the day, the, the sort of impact we're trying to achieve is improvements in livelihoods in communities. So, um, you know, we've been, we're invested not only in 60 decibels as a sort of a corporate entity, but um, we we use their research um, to inform, um, you know, to inform our, our lending activity, whether that's, you know, overseas or here domestically. They're, they're doing some really interesting work right now with um, CDFIs in, in persistent poverty regions, generating insights from customers who got PPP loans from you know, from CDFIs to really understand um, where and when these these things make a difference. So, um, you know, strongly agree with with the comment that um, communities have to come first in in this dialogue. Yeah, I would support that, and I I'm a big fan of the work of 60 Decibels as well. We use their work across the investment process. Sometimes it's pre-investment, in fact. So we're doing due diligence on what is the customer demand and how would this translate into impact for the the customers or the employees or the suppliers or whatever is the universe of, of um, beneficiary that we're talking about. Yeah, I think it's a very powerful platform and the the aspect of listening um, is it just needs to be much more present yeah. than it is today. Perfect. A beautiful, beautiful comment point for us to end on. Thank you both. I want to um, uh, congratulate you guys both and, and, and thank you for, for a very interesting and informative discussion today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.